uh, welcome everyone for today's uh, seminar by Dr. Valentina Aquila from the Johns Hopkins University in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Uh, so Valentina Aquila uh, grew up in Italy and she did her master's degree in physics at the University of Genova. Uh, but then for her PhD, she went to Germany in Munich at the Ludwig Maximilian University and she switched her field to the study of the atmosphere and climate. And for her doctoral degree, she uh, did improvement in aerosol microphysics uh, in a global climate model. And uh, then for her postdoctoral work, she came to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center where she did this work that she's going to speak to us today on the effect of aerosol or, or volcanic eruptions on stratospheric chemistry and especially ozone. And uh, more recently she's doing very interesting modeling work on, on, on proposed geoengineering experiments. So you may have heard of the idea that if we suspend enough aerosol in, in the stratosphere, then the, it can be arranged that the cooling effect will cancel global warming at the surface. But she's not going to speak to us about that today. She's going to speak about the effect of volcanic aerosol on stratospheric ozone. So let us welcome Valentina Aquila. for the invitation. So, um, I'm going to speak about the response of ozone and nitrogen dioxide to the uh, eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991. Um, here I'm listing my collaborators, so Pete Colarco and Douglas, Paul Newman, Luke Homan, and Rich Dolarski, um, mainly at NASA Goddard. Um, So the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. Mount Pinatubo um, is a volcano in the Philippines, um, which erupted the last time on June 15, 1991. So uh, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo, um, from a scientific point of view, is extremely important. And the point is that it's the largest eruption uh, that reached the stratosphere that took place in the period of the satellite air, in the, during the satellite air which means that we have a huge amount of data on Mount Pinatubo, which can really um, test our theory of uh, what the stratospheric aerosol does on climate. So what I'm showing here are two pictures taken. This one is taken in 1984 from the space shuttle, and the other one is taken in 1991, about two months after the eruption. So what you see here, well, these are clouds. So here is the troposphere, and then here is the stratosphere. So you see a smooth transition. This is a clean, it's a picture of a clean background in the uh, from the troposphere to the stratosphere. Instead, what you see on this side, I'm sorry, I'll move around. What you see here, the troposphere, the stratosphere, and these two lines are the volcanic aerosol layer. So Mount Pinatubo injected um, a lot of SO2 in the stratosphere, which transformed into aerosol. And it's what you see here. By the way, this has nothing to do with your talk, but I'm curious, what's that blue layer above it? Do you have any idea? Uh, your brown layer is the aerosol, right. right? On the right? This one? Yeah, I think they're just two layers of aerosol. Okay. Um, exactly. If you have any question, interrupt me. So don't wait until the end. Um, okay, so what happens when a, when a strong volcanic eruption takes place? So volcanoes, among many other things, um, um, erupt SO2, sulfur dioxide. If they're strong enough, they can erupt it in the stratosphere, where they transform into sulfuric acid, which uh, nucleates or condensate anyway, it transforms into sulfate aerosol. And once you have something in the, in the stratosphere, it tends to stay up for a while, because the, uh, the sinks of aerosol from the stratosphere are much less than in the troposphere. So it has more or less a residence time in the stratosphere of about one year. So what here, what you see is the NASA GIS aerosol optical depth data set. Uh, this is the first reference, of course, it has been modified afterward because it gets to the year 2000. And uh, so this is the um, stratospheric, uh, this is the aerosol optical depth. So it's a measure of how much aerosol you have in the stratosphere. 
this three. One, two, three main uh, red uh, lines are the three major eruptions that took place from 1960 to today. So Agum, El Chichan, and Pinatubo. Now, one first interesting thing is that here, this one, is El Chichan. Um, and Agun is some, somewhere in Indonesia in the southern hemisphere. Anyway, all these three volcanoes are more or less at similar latitudes, so they are in the tropics. But as you can see here, uh, the dispersion of the, of the aerosol from the volcanic eruptions is completely different. So in the case of Agung, it went to the southern hemisphere, El Chichan to the northern hemisphere, when in the case of Pinatubo, it went to both hemispheres. Now, what happens when you have one of these major volcanic eruptions that, erupt, that inject aerosol into the stratosphere? So a lot of stuff takes place. So this is a cartoon that shows all the things that happen to the stratospheric aerosol. Um, you have, in general, uh, sorry, because of the stratospheric aerosol, in general, you have a global cooling. So the surface temperature tends to get cooler. Um, you have a lot of chemistry going on. You have changes in photochemistry. But what I focus on is the ozone destruction. So on this side, the, the blue line is the stratospheric aerosol optical thickness which has the two peaks, one of the El Chichon eruption in 1982, and one in the Mount Pinatubo eruption in 1991. And the, blue, the red line are a Tom's observation of ozone. So here I'm plotting the anomaly of ozone. And you see that after both of these peaks, there is a depletion of ozone. This is the global ozone column. So there is a depletion of the general ozone. Now here is a lot of uh, chemical reaction. Uh, the point is that there are three main ozone depleting cycles in the stratosphere. So one that involves NOx, NO plus NO2, one in the, that involves clots, so particular forms of chlorine, and one that involves OH, so OH plus H HO2. This is the message of this lower part of the slide. Now, now we're going to see a bit of chemistry, but the main point is very simple. So there are, um, we have these three main ozone depleting cycles in the stratosphere. NOx, clocks, and hot cycle. And when you inject aerosol in the stratosphere, these two reactions written here are the most important ones. So what ha let's take the first one, and 2O5 plus water, which is in the aerosol particle, becomes 2HNO3. Two, two so what happens is that if you had an 2O5, eventually an 2O5 would be converted into NOx. Now, if you have more aerosol, you have more of this number one reaction going on. So you have less than 2 of 5, which means less NOx. So less NOx cycle, more ozone. And this is what is in the, main, the dominating cycle in the middle stratosphere. Now still, NOx would also convert, would also participate into these two reactions. So they would convert um, CLO and OH into these species, these are ozone depleting. These species are not ozone depleting. So if you have NOx, you convert ozone from an ozone, uh, sorry, you convert clots and hox from an ozone depleting uh, species to a non-ozone depleting species. So it means less NOx, less of these reactions going on, so more clots, more hox, less ozone. Additionally, NOx can also nullify the hox cycle, so less than 2 of 5, less NOx, more hot cycle, less ozone, which is dominating in the lower stratosphere. This second reaction is important in winter in the polar lower stratosphere. So what happens during winter? There is no sun. A lot of this reaction goes on. You get a lot of HOCl. When the sun comes up, it photolyzes, creates Cl. A lot of clock cycle going on, less ozone. If you add this up, uh, vertically, if you integrate vertically, the result is a depletion of the column, of the ozone column. So this is the take home message of this slide. More aerosol in the stratosphere, it means less NOx and less ozone in the stratosphere. Now, what happened after Mount Pinatubo? These are observations uh, that were taken with a UV VIS instrument um, at Loader, so 45 degrees south. This is the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. And what I'm showing here is the, the anomaly in percent. So clearly, there was a very, very clear depletion of, of NOx. 
of NO2 after um, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. So uh, this is what you expected. I'm showing only data for the southern hemisphere, but the northern hemisphere looked the same. This is what I expect, a lot of aerosol in the stratosphere, depletion of NOx. It means that you have a lot of heterogeneous chemistry going on. We would have expect the same from ozone, but instead what happened is that uh, ozone behaved differently. So here, the upper funnel are Tom's data, um, and I'm showing the anomaly with respect to the previous period, once taken into account the seasonal cycle and increasing chloride. So, um, in the northern hemisphere, this is an average between 30 north and 60 north, so northern mid-latitude. There is indeed a depletion of ozone. Solid line is statistically significant. A depletion of ozone here after Pinatubo. But what happened in the southern hemisphere is that there is no significant depletion. And indeed, there is even a significant increase of ozone after Mount Pinatubo at southern mid-latitude. Now, this is the significance level is one sigma, so it's not that high. This is the zonal mean of the ozone anomaly. This is Mount Pinatubo. And so as you see, there is all this area in the southern hemisphere where there is an increase of ozone instead of a decrease. So the question is, why did that happen? What is the difference between NOx and ozone? Why did they react in a different way? So um, I'm, I'm going to address these two questions. So why the aerosol of Mount Pinatubo reached the southern hemisphere? So why was it different from Agung and El Chichuan? And why did the ozone decrease only in the northern hemisphere and not in the southern hemisphere? This is the outline of my talk. So I'm a climate modeler, so I'm going to present the climate model that I've used for this um, study. And then um, I'm going to address the two questions. So the first one has to do with the volcanic perturbation to the stratospheric dynamics. And the second one has to do with the volcanic perturbation to the stratospheric chemistry and to the combination between the volcanic perturbation to the dynamics and to the uh, chemistry of the stratosphere. This is the picture of Mount Pinatubo, actually before the main eruption of June 15, uh, because during the eruption they also had a, a typhoon, I think, so there, was, there are no photos of the main eruption. And this is how Mount Pinatubo looks now. Okay, this is the chemistry climate model that I use so it's a, it's a GeoCCM, which stands from Goddard Earth Observing System Chemistry Climate Model. It has a general circulation model, which is GEOS-5, uh, which includes, um, well, most of the, of the atmospheric processes, such as the mud processes, turbulent mixing, and such, and the radiation, there is a radiation model too. And then in particular, I, am, I have modified, I have mainly worked with StratChem, which is the module that simulates the stratospheric chemistry and with GoCard, which is an aerosol transport model. So um, aerosol is relatively interactive, um, er relatively interactive, as well as water vapor, ozone, O2, CO2, and clouds are all relatively interactive. Now, um, I do um, climate model runs, so I don't assimilate data. It's a free climate uh, simulation. Uh, the resolution is 2 by 2.5, 72 vertical layers, so it's a well-resolved stratosphere. And I simulate Pinatubo by injecting 20 teragram of SO2 in the model grid box of Mount Pinatubo. On one day, very low, between 16 and 18 kilometers altitude, and I will show you later the vertical profile of the resulting cloud. Since it's a free climate model, I'm not um, I'm not constrained by the observed meteorology, so what you do is an ensemble of different climate simulation, and then you take an average of that. These are the results from my simulation. I'm showing the visible aerosol optical depth. On the left, okay, you're fine. Oh, that would be specified the point. Oh, this. Yeah. On the left, uh, our satellite observation from SAGE-2 and the ADHRR, and on the right are model results. So um, this is Mount Pinatubo, the light blue dot. Oh, I'm not able to use this. This is the Mount Pinatubo, and this is, a Chich uh, this is sorry, Cerro Hudson. So there, there was another much smaller eruption uh, that took place a month after Pinatubo uh, at this latitude. I think it's 45 south. But so part of this high optical thickness that you see here might be due to that 
uh, might be due to that eruption. Now, um, as this is just to show that the model works. So these are global mean aerosol optical thickness. Um, this is the spread of my ensemble simulations. Um, stage two, ADHRR data, and these are my, the, the mean of my simulations. So um, the transport works pretty well. We still have, we are still a bit more north with the bulk of the cloud with respect to the satellite observation, but it's, we're pretty happy with the results of our simulation. Now, to study the effect of the Pinatubo aerosol on um, the dynamics of the stratosphere, uh, we run two sets of simulation. In one set of simulation, our chemistry and our aerosol are coupled to the radiation, which means that the aerosol can modify the meteorology resulting, resulting from the model, calculated by the model. And then I did another set of simulation in which I switch off this interaction. So um, the aerosol is basically a passive tracer and does not modify the meteorology um, of the uh, calculated by the model. In, so I call them interactive aerosol run and non-interactive aerosol run. So what happens, uh, this one is the simulation I showed before. And this one is the one where the aerosol is just a passive tracer. So as you see, you have a bit of transport to the southern hemisphere here, but then the aerosol is taken out, of the, is, um, taken out from the atmosphere very, very quickly. So if you look at it vertically, this is SO4 zonal mean in December 1991. What happens is that if the aerosol does not interact with radiation, it's not transported high enough to stay in the atmosphere, but it all stay where I leave it. So in the, well, you can clearly see the, that it follows the trough goes here. So um, in the case of non-interactive aerosol, there is no transport to the southern hemisphere and there is no lofting about the injection height. So the transport of the volcanic cloud is determined by the aerosol radiative interaction. Now what I'm showing here on the left is the SO4 zonal mean, um, a mass, mass mixing ratio, microgram per kilogram, and the streamline represents the anomaly of the residual circulation. So it's the residual circulation, basically a, a, a zonal, zonally average circu circulation, vertically, I'm showing here. Um, in the run with interactive aerosol minus the run without interactive aerosol. And what it shows is that the aerosol creates an increase of the upwelling and then uh, an increase of the extra, um, of the transport to the, to the extra tropics. Okay. If you look at it on the, on the horizontal plane, so latitude by longitude, this is the long wave heating rate and the anomaly of the horizontal wind in, on July 1991, so it's shortly after the eruption. I'm showing this because about, in about a month after the eruption, you really have a, a zonally symmetric situation where the aerosol has spread all around the globe. See, here it's not yet. And so you see that the, the aerosol, the interaction with, of the aerosol with the radiation <coughs> increase um, the, the transport to the extra tropics. So why did the aerosol from Mount Pinatubo reach the southern hemisphere? And the point is that the, the aerosol absorption of mainly long wave radiation induced the self-lofting of the volcanic cloud, uh, which increased the tropical upwelling and, sorry, there is a <laughs> word missing, um, and the extra tropical downwelling, okay, as I'm showing here. Now, about the second question. Uh, why did the ozone decrease only in the northern hemisphere? So these are the same sounds that I showed before. To address this second problem, I did four sets of climate simulation. So uh, one is, a, is the control simulation. So there is no perturbation, it's a no perturbation simulation. There is no interactive aerosol, aerosol data, and I use the aerosol data uh, the aerosol air density for a clean air. So basically you have a background heterogeneous chemistry going on. So here you have these three parts of the model. One is the meteorology, one is the chemistry, one is the aerosol. They are all decoupled to each other, okay? They all run independently from each other. 
Now I did another set of simulations where I use where I have only a perturbation to the chemistry. So still the aerosol and the meteorology don't communicate with each other, but the aerosol does communicate with the chemistry. So those reactions that I showed you before, they take place on the aerosol. So the aerosol quantity that is important is the aerosol area, uh, surface area density, okay? Now, we do have a way of calculating it online, but just to make it more, to make it closer to the observation, what I did is that I took data from the SAGE satellite and used them as an input to the chemistry module. So I'm calculating the chemistry using this satellite data for the aerosol surface area density. Then I have another set of simulation when I have only the perturbation to the dynamics. So I still use the SAGE aerosol area density, but for a, a, a year without eruption. But I have this connection between the aerosol and the meteorology. And then I have a, a fourth set of simulation when I have both. So I have both this connection from the aerosol to the meteorology and from the aerosol to the chemistry. So I have four sets of simulation, a control one, a, which I call the REF in the following, and then a CAM for the chemistry perturbation, a DIN for the dynamics, and the full for both chemistry and dynamics. Now what happens, um, these are the um, anomaly of NOx. This is the solid line that I showed you before. And now in the dynamics, in the simulation where I only have the interaction between the uh, aerosol and the dynamics and not to the chemistry, there is absolutely no change in NOx. So there is no NOx anomaly. The complete anomaly of NOx, the one in full, is only due to the chemistry. So as you see, they basically overlap to each other. Okay. Now this is what happens to ozone. In the southern hemisphere, in this case, sorry, in the northern hemisphere, the green one is the simulation with only the dynamics, and there is no, it's all dashed, so it means nothing is significantly different from zero. Now, the blue is the one with the chemistry, and they start being significant from zero down here. And the one with the, both chemistry and dynamics is similar to the one with only the chemistry. So it means that in the northern hemisphere, the anomaly of ozone is driven by the change in the chemistry. If you look at the southern hemisphere instead, this is the dynamics, and you cannot see it here because the black line is on top, the top data, but here there is a bit that is statistically significant. This is the one with only chemistry and the anomaly different from zero, significantly different from zero, start from February 1992. And then this, the red line, is the one with both the dynamics and the chemistry. Now the shaded area, the gray area, shows where the effect of the aerosol on the stratospheric chemistry um, is sign um, sorry, basically shows when the results from the simulation with only the effect of the aerosol on the chemistry statistically different from the simulation with both the effect of the aerosol on the chemistry and the dynamics. So it shows those areas where the effect of the aerosol on the dynamics is important for the concentration of ozone. So there is this area here where once you introduce the effect of the aerosol on the dynamics, you get the positive anomaly that I showed you before in the TOMS data. And then there is this area here where the chemistry, um, that where the, chem the effect of the aerosol on the chemistry does that negative anomaly that is observed, that would be observed but is not because because of the, of the counteraction of the effect of the aerosol on the dynamics. And then here, CAM and FULL are the same. So it means that here, um, the effect of the aerosol on ozone is basically due to the chemistry. So here is basically due to the dynamics, here is basically due to the chemistry, okay? And here, chemistry and dynamics kind of cancel each other because you see that your, um, the FULL line is not statistically significant. So 
What I'm saying is that the NO2 anomaly is mainly caused by the enhancement in the chemistry due to the volcanic aerosol, while the ozone anomaly is mainly caused by the enhanced chemistry in the northern hemisphere. By caused by changes in, but in the southern hemisphere instead is caused by changes in the dynamics during the first year after the eruption and afterward by changes in the chemistry. Now here I'm showing how the perturbation to the dynamics changes the, the concentration of ozone. So as I showed before, the warming of the aerosol increased the upwelling in the tropics and consequently the downwelling in the extra tropics. Now when you do that, you have two effects going on. So one, you increase the upwelling, so it goes, the air mass goes faster, so you have less time of forming ozone. Secondarily, you are basically moving air, which is the reach of ozone, so ozone is very high in the, in the stratosphere, and then it decreases. So you're moving, uh, sorry, it's low in the troposphere, high in the stratosphere, and then low again. So what you do, you take air from the troposphere, which is ozone, which is clean of ozone, and you put it where you would have a lot of ozone. That's why you get a negative anomaly here. Well, and then you displace the air that would have a lot of ozone where you would have less. That's why you get this positive anomaly here. So this is an average of June, July, August, 1991. So this is when, right after the eruption, when the aerosol is very concentrated, and so the effect of the dynamics is stronger, okay? This is instead what, about one year after the eruption, September, October, November, 1992. The ozone is dispersed, it's not very concentrated, you don't have much warming in one location, so <clears throat> the effect on the dynamics is not very strong anymore. What you have left is the effect on the chemistry. So, Oh, this should be pink, even though you don't see it very much with a projector. But so this is what I was telling you before, that in the mid-stratosphere you have a suppression of the NOx cycle, which gives an enhancement of ozone. And in the lower stratosphere <coughs> you have a, an enhancement of the Hox and clock cycle, which leads to a depletion of ozone. So the, uh, the, the left figure, is it uh, from the uh, model, but you have only the dynamics? Yes. This is the perturbation only, uh, this is the, the runs with only dynamics effect. So there's no chemistry, you're not making ozone chemistry, you're not making ozone at all in the tropics then, is that right? Uh, so in other words, does your model have ozone chemistry, stratospheric ozone chemistry production? It does, yes. It does? Uh, yes. But that, does that include? No, not in the left figures. No, wait a second. This one, yeah, the production is there. What is not there is the effect of the aerosol of the chemistry. So you have background heterogeneous chemistry going on. In background homogeneous chemistry too. Yes. Okay. okay. So these are the <clears throat> these are the anomaly of the ozone column. So latitude and time. In the case with only the chemistry perturbation, only dynamics perturbation, and both chemistry and dynamics perturbation. So the dotted areas are 95% statistically significant. So in the case of only chemistry perturbation, the area that is statistically significant is here. So when you integrate vertically, you get the decrease of ozone, but not in the beginning. In the case of the anti-dynamics perturbation, this is most um, of the um, of the, uh, the parts that are statistically significant, and there is this depletion of ozone here, and this increase of ozone here. And when you add them both, you basically, when in the run with both chemistry and dynamics perturbation, in the beginning, the dynamics perturbation is the one that you see, and then you see the, the effect of the aerosol on the dynamics. And these are the same plots for only chemistry perturbation and only dynamics perturbation, but uh, so vertical, vertical profile, pressure by latitude. So in June, July, August 1991, the chemistry perturbation doesn't show any significant um, depletion of ozone, and significant change, but in June, July, August 1992, again, you have the, check, the increase of ozone in the middle stratosphere and the depletion, of, the depletion of ozone below. And this is if you have only the dynamics perturbation in June, July, August 1991, there is this depletion of ozone and this increase of ozone, but you don't see much significant area in June, July, August 1992. Now, I'm used to talk where I'm interrupted every other minute, <laughs> so I went, I went very quick, sorry for that but I'm already at my summary. So these are the answer, um, these are the two points that I wanted to make. So why did the aerosol from Mount Pinatubo is the southern hemisphere, and this is due to the modification um, of, the of the stratospheric dynamic from uh, 
Dierazol. So Dierazol absorbs mainly long wave radiation, warm up the, strat the lower stratosphere where most of the aerosol is, and changes, increase the upwelling in the tropics and the downwell into the extratropic. And this same effect also um, creates a change in the an anomaly in the ozone column. That was the one that was observed. So um, the increased tropical upwelling and the subsequent extratropical downwelling caused, caused by the volcanic aerosol caused the tropical negative anomaly, which is here, and the positive anomaly that was observed in the southern hemisphere. Now, the important message is that um, the, you have a direct effect of enhanced antineterogeneous chemistry, which is given by the aerosol from the volcanic eruption, and which, of course, impacts the, the tracers. But you cannot ignore the indirect effect on the stratospheric tracer, which is uh, uh, via the induced perturbation of the atmospheric dynamics. So thank okay. you very much. Question about your first point. Here, in, in this case, you're, you're suggesting that uh, your results suggest that uh, the aerosol actually speeds the dynamics to, to sort of uh, to lock the aerosol uh, and push it into the, in the southern hemisphere. But why didn't it work for the other two cases? So, in the El Chichon, El Chichon right. and Agum um, cases. I'm sorry, I didn't include this uh, the slides. I did make some tests. So, some other grants where I have been a tubo, but this other uh, where I have same location, same season, and such of Pinatubo, mm -hmm. but with the injection amount that was similar to Agung and El Chichon. Yeah. It was instead than 20 teragram of SO2, it was about seven, so it was a much, much smaller eruption. What happens is that basically it's just not enough aer aerosol to warm enough, enough the stratosphere to create such a, a perturbation of the dynamics. So it's just a matter of how large the eruption, how much stuff you have in the stratosphere in those two cases. And they go, um, they go, what did I put in? Okay, so they go basically, Agong is in the southern hemisphere, Chichon is in the north, so they just follow the normal circulation without modifying it very much. Another experiment which is pretty interesting that I did, I did, um, I put Pinatubo in different season. So the change of the Brewer Dobson circulation uh, is actually in phase with the uh, with the phase of the QBO. Okay, of the sorry, in phase uh, with the phase of the Brewer Dobson circulation. So in this in August it tends to go this way, and this is what is enhanced. Um, now this up here, it's where. Um, most of the of the transport take place. So what you see is that uh, if you look at like September or October 1991, um, you see a pattern of transport in the lower stratosphere here to the northern hemisphere, and then the transport to the southern hemisphere of the volcanic aerosol goes through the middle stratosphere. So it takes place up here. Okay. So if you don't have enough aerosol, you don't, you cannot raise it high enough to reach this pattern of transport, uh, this, this pathway to the southern hemisphere. And this other experiment that I made where I tried the Pinatubo in January and in April, uh, in January, you basically see, you basically see the same uh, modification, the same enhancement of the Brewer Dobson circulation, but most toward the northern hemisphere. And when you look at the ozone anomaly, well, let's look at the simulations are always clearer than the data. When you see, you see exactly this anomaly, but the positive is here. So you see it mirror to the northern hemisphere just because of the change of the, of the season of the eruption. That's the environment. But there was a QBO in this model, right? Sorry. In this one, there was not yet. Have you done experiments at different phase of QBO? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. The QBO, uh, the internal QBO results I showed you before, they're done with a new one. Yeah, I was just wondering because of the increased law, it wouldn't make much difference if it's an easterly phase or westerly phase, the additional law of it, it might be. I don't know because this is a, like you really have <laughs> the, the model with this. It's a really big perturbation. Yeah, yeah. So I think it would overwhelm the QBO, but I should try it. Yeah, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. So, Kappa Zima, do you have a question? 
Yes, um, you're going to have to walk me slowly on this. Sure. I don't know much. Um, my understanding is that the aerosol tend to cool the general global temperature because they are, they are blocking the incoming mm -hmm. uh, light. So in, but in this particular case, the most the effect which is seen is the absorption of the long wave from the surface. Mm -hmm. What is the what is the role of the cooling? Because we have evidence of cooling. Why why does it then warm? Does it just warm up the stratosphere? Right. It warms up the stratosphere. So after Pinatubo, they observed the cooling of the of the global globally average temperature. So there was this effect of blocking the the short wave radiation from the sun. Shouldn't then that lower the the, the long wave coming off the surface? Should start. Shouldn't the long wave coming off the Earth's surface be lower then? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That might be. It's okay. This is a, the model does not have an interactive ocean, but does have like the temperature on land changes. So if you have less long wave coming from the surface, you will also have <coughs> more absorption. But it's not that okay. much of a difference okay. respect so to this work. So it's the enough energy to warm up the. Yeah. Hills. But in fact, there is observations showing that after Pinatobo, there was a warming of the lower stratosphere, right. even though there was a cooling of the surface. Okay. Those, that, those are direct observations. Yeah, that's true. But the temperature up there is always still colder than the surface. But even if the surface is yeah. cold, it's cool 10 yeah. degrees, yeah, it's cool. much, much warmer, yeah. much more energy yeah. than 220, 210 K in the lower stratosphere. So you still gain. Yeah. And even though you decrease incoming, you still gain by absorption of long wave. I just had a brief question. So these anomalies were zonally averaged, right? But would, would you say there was any longitudinal structure to, um, to if you were to take like a column average of these anomalies that you would be able to see? Anomalies in, in what? In what? In ozone or in? Uh, in, in like ozone, for example, that, that um, would correspond to um, the previous figure. I think. Well, I do. Oh. Or the, or the next, the one where you show the. the I don't really think so because you're speaking about stratospheric ozone, which is, I mean, it's my. I mean, if you look at the day by day, you you do have longitudinal differences. But if you make a, even a monthly average, I don't know if you if you would still have it. Okay. So I have a question. So do you uh, do you think that the results you get are sensitive to the the way you parameterize the aerosols? Like yeah, the aerosols exactly have it. So can you please speak to everybody because many people here are interested in. Aerosol microphysics. Okay, so this is a, the our aerosol model is a bulk model, which means it's a it's a fairly simple model. So we don't have a parametrization. We don't have a, a way of simulating the size of the aerosol. We assume a size. So <clears throat> the size of the aerosol is very important because it, it impacts. So okay, here is where I wanted to go. The size of the aerosol changes the. Uh, radiative properties of the aerosol, so how much light, how much radiation they absorb or they reflect, and especially very important for the stratosphere, it changes how quick they settle down of the stratosphere. Okay, so I had to choose a parameter because my mother go kart requires that, and what I did, I did a lot of sensitivity tests, and in the end, I took the parameter that optimizes the the settling away of the aerosol from the stratosphere and to match the aerosol optical thickness with the observation. Then, um, so this work was done with the model how we had it one year ago. After that, we introduced a microphysical model and we redid the Pinatubo simulation. So the microphysical model calculates the size distribution. And we saw that uh, uh, if the microphysical model had a size distribution like this, basically it was like this, where this is the radius, and this is the, let's say, the number of aerosols. So it had a big tail here. This is in logarithmic scale. The size distribution that we assumed was exactly here. So we could anyway simulate most of the mass of the aerosol, which is in this enlarged radius. OK, thank you. So Pink has a question. Right. Can you please go back to the satellite images? Uh, you mean this one? No, the satellite images are from the, 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 the pictures, you mean? Yes. 
Yeah, that's this one. Right, in the, in the right hand is in, okay, right after the eruption. So do you have some image after several years, for example, like in 1998 or even, even later, which could possibly show how long that one, that, that the Earth was last? I, I don't have a picture like this. I can tell you in 1998 you couldn't see anything. What I can show you is this. Okay, this, the global mean aerosol optical thickness. So the red and the blue, they are from data. So you see the decay. And when you are here, this is December, September, October 1994 is the last data. And you already have nearly nothing. So actually we're talking about the Bella source of the aerosols Sphere and we leave that delta function impact on the global dynamics. But that's a, that's a big deal. The, the, the impact on the, the strong impact of the dynamics that I've shown, I would say it's not longer than one year, even less yeah. after the eruption. Okay. So basically, normally, after one year after the eruption, you have about one third of the aerosols being in the stratosphere, right. and about five years you have nearly nothing. Depends how big the eruption is, of course. The bigger the eruption, the longer it lasts. But like for Pinatubo, that was the case. Right. By the way, how how top uh, how high was this eruption reach? I mean, the top. The top of the cloud was observed up to high per, uh, high um, up to thirty kilometers altitude. John, do you have any questions? Yeah. So the data that you showed at Lauder for column ozone, um, if you're looking at an actual increase as a result of dynamics, <coughs> um, can you look at vertical profiles of ozone? Because uh, your vertical profile anomaly should be very different than that in the northern hemisphere. Right. In in data. Yeah. Uh, Actual data. I I don't have that. I have only ozone column data. Yes, Margaret. And another question, and that's in the spot. Uh, you're looking. At, you're contrasting thirty north to sixty north, and thirty south to sixty south. One big difference in in that is that you have dilution of the ozone hole into the 30 and 60 south, whereas much less in the 30 to 60 north. How much difference does that make in the evolution of, the, of those mid to high latitude ozone behaviors? It might make quite a difference. All these things are really controlled when you have a class. That's why it's easier with class and simulation than sure. with uh, data. So, uh, I can say in my climate simulation, everything else is exactly the same except for the aerosol perturbation. So anything I see, even a perturbation of the ozone hole, I know that it's originated from the aerosol right, right. with it. In the data, yeah, it might have a difference. Yes. Because it's percent total column. You're mm -hmm. not looking at vertical distribution. If you look That's at vertical true. distribution, I think you'd get a lot of information. That's true. So let us, oh, uh, just a comment on the Mark's question on the two layers, the brown and the and the blue line. I, I would, I think the blue one is the due to Riley, uh, Riley scattering, and the next one is the scattering. Uh -huh, okay. I was wondering whether, in fact, the different settling rates might give you a different color yeah. signature. Yeah, it does that. It yeah. might be. Yeah. You right. mean that the the larger aerosol are already? That's what. Yeah. I mean, you also mean that you have two yeah. uh, lines of yeah. concentration, yeah. so a minimum of concentration is there. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, I'm just curious. Could be gas phase, too. So let us thank our speaker for such an interesting talk. <laughs>
was upset. Yeah. Yes. It's on the back. I just had, I mean, maybe a comment to that, um, that, pic, that that Professor Geller had yeah. regarding those two, um, those two bands. Yeah. Would that be corresponding to Krasny to this figure where you took only the way Let me give you the um, Aurelie scattered when he's finished with the scattered. It might be. Also, put this picture back. So, I'm just going to put it in the first So, it might be. You have to be. Of course, it can. When you look at the data. So, yeah, when you look at the data, you maybe see that there are two. I just have one, one brief question. Uh, uh, also, did you see the effect of, of, of the position of the latitude of the perturbation? Like, if you were to shift it, so some, like, say, some latitudes further north. The perturbation? Like, like the erupt caused by this eruption, so, um, the, the initial uh, ejection of the aerosol. Okay. So, like, like, if you were to put it, like, if you were to say, because uh, you, you put it some, at some latitude corresponding to not like the right. Like what if what if um, you should go a little further north? Would that make a difference? I think um, I don't know. I haven't seen this, but I think that the longer you stay, let's say what you can do to the top of the pike, so so that thing, you know, it should be kind of similar because it's. Uh,